Good evening. evening. And welcome everybody to our worship service this evening. This is the the last of our midweek services. Uh, I I see a lot of familiar faces, people who have been able to um, kind of follow through with all of the services that we've had. And then and some who are new and, and each service really does stand on its own. Today we'll be talking about morality, our sense of what's right and what's wrong and, and how those kinds of questions affect us in our own personal walk with the Lord and also um, how other people will want to ask us as Christians about the kind of uh, moral stands that we take and why we, we take those stands and, and, and feel so strongly about those things. And so those are the kinds of things that we'll be addressing tonight. Uh, with the order of service that you have in your hands. We begin by singing hymn number 
The Old Testament reading is from Job, the 31st chapter. If I have withheld anything that the poor desired, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the fatherless has not eaten of it, for from my youth the fatherless grew up with me as with a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or the needy without covering, if his body was not blessed, has not blessed me, and if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless because I saw my help in the gate, then let my shoulder blade fall from my shoulder, and let my arm be broken from its socket. For I was in terror of calamity from God, and I could not have faced his majesty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from James, the second chapter. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will, be, he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And, and when would we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for you, for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. 
I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Uh, you may be seated for the hymn of the word. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, throughout this Lenten season, we've been talking about all kinds of questions that people might ask us as Christians. So tonight, the last of our midweek services, we're going to talk about and consider questions on morality. And I've kind of saved this one. It, it, it fits in with the readings and it fits in with the, the, the flow of, of the season. But also, it, it works out really well because I think that this is the key question to 
a lot of the other questions that we've already considered during this season. I think we need to be prepared to answer these kinds of questions as much as any of the other ones. And the reason I say that is because all of those questions about science and, and evolution, about hypocrisy and suffering and authority and church and state, all of those things that we ask, I think oftentimes are smoke screens that are put up to hide what's really on people's hearts and minds, and that is that they don't like the morality that, that most Christians proclaim or, or hold to. They don't like the biblical morality that is so far removed from what we see all around us in the culture, and it seems to be uh, getting worse. I believe this is the main reason that people come up with those questions. See, if people don't like a biblical lifestyle, what they will do then is have to try to undermine the scriptures in order to say, well, then if the scriptures can be undermined, then that's not going to be binding on me. I can disregard what the scriptures are teaching about what's right and what's wrong. Besides that, we live at a time when people, a growing number of people in our culture, will refuse to recognize that there is any such thing as any kind of a moral absolute. We, we live in a culture that doesn't want to see anything as an absolute and, and, and saying that things are changing and that we need to go with the flow, that people change and times change. And so, so morality has to change as well for those folks. And the reason for that is because they don't want to agree to a, an absolute morality because they don't want to agree to the possibility of an absolute truth at all. Everything is subject to change. I'm going to talk about that question on Palm Sunday. We'll, we'll talk about uh, the, the questions that people will ask about truth, especially as we listen to Caiaphas and the priests and their disregard for truth. And then we'll also hear Pilate's classic question for today, and that is, what is truth? We'll, we'll address that then. So, so tonight's topic on morality really is a, uh, a kind of a lead-in to what we're going to be talking about on Sunday. And, and, they, and they really complement each other. The fact is, is the gap between biblical morality and the world's morality, I think, is widening by the day, not by decades the way it used to be. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, I never would have dreamed of the kinds of things that are said or done on television network television for that matter, let alone cable TV. The power of pornography is rampant. It's destroying lives. It's destroying marriages. Casual sex has become so commonplace, which has then led to an expectation rather than an exception of, of living together before marriage, if marriage is even considered at all. I, I knew for some time that same-sex attraction was going to be a, a watershed issue in our society. But I never thought that the proponents of, of same-sex marriage would have the power to force a, a CEO of a major corporation in Silicon Valley to resign just because of a, a campaign contribution that was made some six years ago. Abortion, it's been a long-standing issue for the last 50 years, but I never would have dreamed that, that the government would be funding with people's taxpayers' dollars contraception and abortion through government-sponsored health care. Never saw that coming. I knew marijuana was popular in, in my home state in Colorado when I was growing up and in high school. Never dreamed it would have been legalized there. You know, I could go on and on and on. I think you get the idea that as the gap widens, Christians' complaints get louder, and then the backlash from the opposite 
side gets stronger and harsh, more harsh, the criticism that, that Christians are dealing with. So the question becomes, well, what do we do? What can we say when those kinds of questions come our way? Tonight I want to say that we want to look at the very scriptures that people are, being con are contending with and in order to talk about these kinds of issues. We're coming to the last night of our, our, our midweek Lenten services. At the same time, we are coming to the last leg of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. He is now in Jerusalem. Last Tuesday, we talked about that. We, we, we talked about how to handle questions about suffering by looking at Jesus' prophecies about what would happen in the end times and how much suffering there would be and, and how it would escalate and how there would be a purpose in that and, and how people ask about that. How can God allow that? And, then, and, and skeptics will ask, well, either God, you know, he must not be good or he must not be great. And, and so we looked at it and realized, no, we recognize that, that God is great and good and that he uses these kinds of things to bring people to a point of faith that Jesus himself suffered greatly in order to, to accomplish good and great things, the best of things with our eternal life in heaven. And then, and then I talked about the fact that when we go through those difficult times and we receive comfort from the Lord, our good and great and gracious God, then that gives us the means that we need to be able to help people when they are dealing with difficult issues that are similar to what we went through. And so all of that leads into what I want to talk about tonight. And that is comforting one another when they are going through some kind of hardship. When people are suffering. Now I want you to keep in mind that Jesus taught the things that we talked about last week. It was early on the Tuesday morning before he was crucified. He would be crucified on that Friday. Well, what we're talking about tonight were things that he taught on that same Tuesday, only in the evening. So it makes sense that when Jesus spoke about all of these end-time events in the morning, that he would then talk about judgment in the evening. And when he talked about the suffering that people would go through, then that the very outcome of our faith, that the, the thing that he talks about in the parable is comforting people who are hurting in the midst of suffering. It all fits together. It makes sense. And so we heard it tonight. He says, he just lays it all out. He says, we are to feed the hungry, quench the thirst of the thirsty, clothe the naked, welcome strangers, visit the poor, visit the imprisoned. In a word, all of that is love. Simply love. Love is the means and love is the motivation for doing all of those things that Jesus lists there as he speaks about that final judgment. Love is the summary of of our morality. It is the summary of what we do that is right and wrong. Uh, you, you think of it in terms of the Ten Commandments, but then St. Paul says in, in Romans chapter 13, verse 10, that love is the summary of the law. It is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus, Matthew 22. He's there in Jerusalem for the final time. A, a lawyer comes and asks him, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so you can see how love is a fulfillment of all of these things. And then when, you, when we hear then a little later in Matthew 25 about what's being said to these people who are standing before the throne of God. And when he says, if you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. And we know that Jesus is speaking about himself. I mean, who is he talking about here? Jesus is talking about himself when he says, and you did it unto me. 
And when he says in, in Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul, and the same Lord, and there's the same Lord that he's talking about in 25, then, then you put that together and realize that when we love the Lord with all our heart and mind and soul, we are loving Jesus, who has said that we want to love people by feeding, quenching the thirst, clothing, visiting, all of those things. So in other words, we are loving the Lord and we are loving our neighbor in the same act. So Matthew 22 and Matthew 25 dovetail with one another. They are the same thing. They are saying the same things as we talk about loving neighbors. So really, and practically, we have come full circle from where we started on Ash Wednesday when we talked about questions of hypocrisy and said that people call us as Christians hypocrites when we say one thing and then do another. This is what this is saying. Skeptics will call us hypocrites when we, when we don't live up to what we say. They call us haters when we take moral stands. But wouldn't it be just as hypocritical if we were to say, this is what the Bible says, and I believe in the Bible, but I'm not going to take a stand on that. I think that would be the height of hypocrisy and the lowest level of love to not take those stands. Because true love takes stands, hard stands, tough stands. True love is tough. And that's what we see in the gospel. See, that's what Jesus did for us. He took stands for us. He suffered on a cross for us. When we heard the, the, the lesson from Job chapter 31, you need to understand Job is a type of Christ. He is a, a kind of a picture, a forerunner of what Jesus would accomplish. And when he asked these if questions, if I, if I didn't help the poor, if I didn't help the fatherless, if I didn't do all of these things... But we also recognize that Job is simply a man because in the very end of the, of the text he says, for I was in terror of calamity from God. What he's saying is, the reason I did all those things, that was because I was afraid. I was fearful. It was, it was, a, it was motivated by fear of God. Jesus did all of those things, only did them perfectly, and he did it out of love. Love for the Father and love for us. That's what James is talking about. When he talks about the fact that we can have faith, but if there are no works, then that's a dead faith. That's not love. That's not receiving love. That's, it's, when, we, when we listen to, and people listen to Matthew 25, oftentimes people will say, oh, that sounds so works righteous. It's not. When it talks about the people and, and the kingdom that has been prepared for God's people, for his chosen ones, that, that, that they had received the benefits of God's forgiveness and life and salvation, and that is the very thing that motivated them to live a life of love for other people. Uh, and as they lived that life of love for other people, they were doing it for Christ himself, loving God and loving neighbor all in the same act. And so Matthew 25 is not works righteous, but it's gospel-centered. And Matthew 25, then, needs to become our mantra when it comes to living our life of love. Doing it for the least of these, my brothers, we have done it for the Lord. The Lord who had suffered and died. You know, when we, when we heard Job talk about the things that he had done, and if he hadn't done those things, that he would uh, have his shoulder wrenched out of, his, out of the socket and, and, and separated from his shoulder blade. This is the very thing that Jesus did when he hung on the cross. When people were crucified, their joints would be pulled out of place as they fought for every last breath. And that's what Jesus did for us as he suffered a sinner's death in the on the cross in our place because of his love for us. And so that gives us some talking points. We want to make sure that when we talk about the things that we take a stand on,
that we also come through with acts of love. Because that's what people will always say. Oh, you, you say that abortion is wrong, but you don't help those mothers. Oh, you, you say that you love people, but you don't help those AIDS victims. The fact is, is that the Christian church throughout the history of mankind has always been, God's people have been the forefront, the forefront and have invested more in charity and in love and in care than any other people group in the history of mankind throughout the world. We need to remember that as a talking point. We need to share that with people as we, as we speak to them about our faith and about the stands that we take. And as we do, we need to do it with gentleness. We need to do it with respect. We don't want to use derogatory language as we talk about the people, uh, whether they be there present or, or whether we do it with some kind of crude humor in our own, uh, within our own groups. And we need to be prepared for people that, that will call us haters, that there will be opponents, there will be a backlash. But as we do, we can never return that with anger, and, and as soon as we do, we've lost the discussion. But we want to make sure that everything that we say and everything that we do is motivated by, tempered by, and communicating to them the love that God has for them and us as mutual sinners, one no more holy and none more no, no less sinful than the other until we have received that forgiveness. And once we have received that forgiveness, then we are God's people who are living lives according to his will for the sake of his love that gives us a, a real read and an understanding of what's right and what's wrong. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus.